welcome to this week's episode of Fan Fatales. I'm Emma. And I'm Gabby. And this week we're going to be discussing the history of Imagineering and the Disney parks. That's right. So Gabby and I are both wearing our amazing spirit jerseys, My Walt Disney World and Her Disneyland. Yes. Then I'm drinking some green tea out of a Disney mug with with hat. Out of a Disney mug, which has Mickey Mouse, and it says, who says we have to grow up, Walt Disney? Yep, and I'm drinking some decaf out of a clear mug because I'm house-sitting and I don't have my regular supply of mugs today. Yeah, so shall we get started? Absolutely! So fasten your seatbelts and maintain all arms, hand, feet, hands, feet, and legs inside the ride vehicle, and away we go! So Gabby... What is Imagineering? So Imagineering is the research and development arm of the Walt Disney Company. They're responsible for the creation, design, and construction of Disney theme parks and attractions worldwide. The company also manages the Walt Disney Company's properties from Walt Disney Studios in Burbank to New Amsterdam Theater in Times Square. And... um, So it was founded by Walt Disney to oversee the production of Disneyland, and it was originally known as Walt Disney Inc., then WED Enterprises, from the initials meaning Walter Elias Disney, the company's co-founder's full name. And it's headquartered in Glendale, California. Imagineering is composed of the quote-unquote Imagineers, who are illustrators, architects, engineers, lighting designers, show writers, and graphic designers. That's right, and I actually know some Imagineers that go to my church back home. In fact, one of my family friends who's an Imagineer is the head on the first of their many current projects that will be opening in on March 1st of 2022 in Walt Disney World, which is the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser. Yeah, they have a ton of current projects that are going on, and there are some that have like yet to be released of when they're coming out, but there's like a ton. So really yes. quick, Emma already mentioned the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser that's going to come out in on March 1st of 22 in Disney World. Um, then we have the Tokyo Disney Resort Toy Story Hotel, and that's going to be on April 5th, 2022. Um, and that one's going to be at Tokyo Disney Resort, of course. Then, and then Disney Cruise Line will be unveiling their new ship, the Disney Wish, on mm-hmm. June 9th of 2022. I'm so excited for that. It's going to be so good. Have you so seen good. the concept art? Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's going to be I wanna so I want to go good. to the Star Wars bar on it so bad. Yep. That's a, the, we're going to go. We're, we'll go. Yeah, we'll go. We'll find a time. Yeah, we'll figure it out. You and me and our boys on a Disney cruise. <laughs> Can you imagine? I think That'd Zach would hate it because he'd be like, there's too much Disney. I can't handle it right now. And I'd be like, You exploding. see, Sean wants to go on one so bad. Okay, so it'll just be you and me. And Sean. (laughs) Sean will be the third wheel. (laughs) I love that. Sean will be the third wheel to us. We'll be like, leave us alone. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So then we all have, (laughs) then we have Arendelle World of Frozen, and that's going to go into Hong Kong Disneyland in 2022. And then the Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in Epcot, which they haven't released a date yet officially i don't think but it comes out in 2022 mm-hmm. and i'm so excited for it i know exactly like where it's going to be mm-hmm. in the park because i always see the construction it's gonna be you don't know any epcot map thing i know but, a tiny bit. um it's gonna be right next to mission space and the new space themed um restaurant that just opened recently i do know where that is okay yeah so it's gonna be in that like little corner cute in the space corner cute so then next we have Arendelle World of Frozen going in at Walt Disney Hollywood Studios Park in 2023. That's news to me. <laughs> Wait, what's that going to be? I don't know. World of Frozen. Okay. Um, and then we're going to get, the, um, and then Hong Kong Disneyland is going to get the Avengers Quinjet experience in 2023 as well. Mm-hmm. And then Fantasy Springs is going to be joining Tokyo Disney Sea in 2023. And then Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railroad, uh, Railway 
will open in Disneyland of 2020 in 2023. Hopefully, I'm like I'm like really stoked to get it because everybody's like, oh my gosh, Runway Railway is so cute. Oh my gosh, I love it so much. I'm I I'm of course sad that um, we had to lose the Great Movie Ride because that was the essence mm-hmm. of Hollywood Studios. Yeah, but I do love Ru- Mickey's Runaway Railway. And for those of you who have been on the Hollywood Studios one, they make a very small reference to the Great Movie Ride in it. Oh, that's cute. At least in ours. There's, like, a carnival scene, and on one of the carnival, like, booths, they mm-hmm. have a poster that says um, the Great Movie Ride. Oh, that's cute. So, like, that touch, like, made me feel better Aww. about that being away. Good. And then the next projects are to be announced when they're going to be completed and or unveiled. So they're still in probably like the earliest stages of building, of designing and all that stuff. And that is going to be an Avengers campus in Walt Disney's Hollywood Studios. Which I bet you it's going to be um, Wakanda with all the Universal Orlando owning the Marvel Avengers Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and X-Men rights. Yeah. And we have already talked about the logistics of that. Way early in the podcast. Yeah. So if you want to go back, go ahead and check that out. It was our Disneyland versus Disney World video. I believe so, yeah. Right after your Disneyland trip. I know. I miss it so much. (laughs) And then um, Disney's California Adventure will also be getting the Avengers Quinjet experience. Yes. Uh, and then to be announced. Yeah. And then the Disney Cruise Line is going to be getting three new ships added to their repertoire of ships. One of them is going to be titled Lighthouse Point, and the other two have yet to be titled. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. They've been going like with the dream and all that, with all the. Yeah. Um, so I was like, is that going to be like a restaurant at Castaway K or something? No, it's when like. I saw the lights. Yeah, because, like, it's the Disney dream, the Disney wish, Disney wonder, Disney magic, Disney magic, Disney fantasy, fantasy, yeah. I don't like that. And then Disneyland and Magic Kingdom will be getting the new Princess and the Frog themed attraction. Yeah, which is just re-theming of Splash Mountain, right? Yes. Yeah. And actually, um, the next one comes out in 2022 sometime. Hmm. When I found this, it said it was still to be announced, but okay. That's cool. <laughs> That's what I had heard last, was that this next one was. Oh. Well, you say what it is. I will. The next one is going to be uh, the Tron light cycle run that's going to come out in Magic Kingdom. I had heard that it was going to be unveiled in 2022, but I wasn't really sure if that was true or if it was just rumors. And uh, the last two that are in this to be announced category. Okay. So it was originally scheduled to open for the 50th anniversary in October 2021, but the opening date has been pushed uh, back to 2022 during the 18-month 50th celebration. Got it. So we don't know when, but it is. Got it. And then the next three? Two. Yeah, three. No, three. Three? Is there another one? Oh, yeah, three. So the next three are going to be in Epcot, and they're going to be a Journey of Water experience, and it's going to be Moana themed, and it's going to be in not the country part of Epcot, but the other part. I can't remember what it's called, but it's going to be like right by the sea experience with Nemo. And then the a Play Pavilion, another one, and then Wondrous China, which do we know what Wondrous China is? Not a clue. I'm sure it's a new um, show because they used to have... Yep, it's a new show. And it says opening date, December 1st, 2021. I don't think that happened. December 1st, Oh, December 1st is coming up. I'm... (laughs) (laughs) And it's going to be a um, Circle Vision 360 degree movie at the China Pavilion. Nice. 
And then, last, but certainly not least, Shanghai Disneyland will be getting a Zootopia-themed area to be announced. Yeah, and I think that's going to be really interesting to see what they're going to do with that. Same. I am honestly shocked that they haven't added anything um, Zootopia into Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm. Because they haven't. There's no trace of Judy Hopps or Nick Wilde in Animal Kingdom. Like at all? Like at all. Oh my goodness. Like the few times I've met Nick and Judy in the parks, we're at Tomorrowland. Of all places in Magic Kingdom. (laughs) That's super weird, but okay. Yeah. But I have thoughts about what they should do for Animal Kingdom. Hmm. Like, they have the technology where they can make animatronic meet-and-greet characters of the Lion King characters. Yeah. I mean, they did it with the cars from Cars. They did it so. with the cars. Why they can't they it do it with Lion King? Simba. Yeah. Or Pumbaa and Timon. Because there's really no characters at Animal, Animal Kingdom. Kingdom. Yeah. It's Pocahontas and Tarzan. Yeah, and, and we'll get um, into why there's not really that much Russell. IP in uh, Animal Kingdom. Because yeah. we're going to talk about that. Uh, what what happened? Like, how did Imagineering become to be what it was? Yeah. Or so what it is today. the very long history of yes. Imagineering? Yes. And this history is going to take us all the way back to 1952 when Walt Disney Imagineering was formed by Walt Disney on December 16th of 1952 as WED Enterprises to develop three plans, sorry, to develop plans for a theme park and to manage Disney's personal assets. It was originally an independent private company owned by Walt Disney himself, but on February 3rd, 1965, it was merged into Walt Disney Productions and is currently known as Walt Disney Imagineering, or WDI. Disney Imagineering, or simply Imagineering. So the Imagineering team is known most for building the six Disney parks around the world, which are Disneyland Resort in Anaheim, California, Walt Disney World in Lake Buena Vista, Florida, um... Tokyo Disney Resort in Yuresu, Chiba, Japan. If I'm saying that wrong, I'm so sorry. Don't come for me. Um, Disneyland Paris in Marne, La Vie, La La Ville. I have no idea. Again, in France. Um, Hong Kong Disneyland Resort in Lantou Island, Hong Kong, China. And Shanghai Disney in Pudong, Shanghai, China. The first use of the term Imagineering, a combination of imagination and engineering, was used by artist Arthur C. Braidbog to describe his work. Wed Enterprises applied for a trademark for the term in 1967, claiming first use in 1962. Yep. So, in 1952, when Wed was asked to design and build Disneyland, Walt and his brother Roy O. Disney formed Disneyland, Inc., to build, design, and manage Disneyland and produce the Disneyland television show. Interesting. Yeah. Disneyland Inc. was absorbed into Wed Enterprises, and Wed Enterprises became a division of Walt Disney Studios itself, a division of Walt Disney Productions, now named the Walt Disney Company. By the time Disney had spent half the money on Disneyland, he told Imagineer, Harper Goff that there wasn't one thing he thought that anyone would spend 15 cents on. Whether or not the Disney company survived was reliant on the success of Disneyland, and Walt had to cash in a personal life insurance policy to keep the project alive. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, so... The cost... Go ahead. The cost spiraled out of control, and by opening day... They had spent $17 million, that's million with an M, which was triple the original budget. Yeah. (laughs) So finally, Disneyland opened on July 17th of 1955. Opening day was a disaster. Mm -hmm. The blacktop was not set. There was a plumber's strike and Walt had to decide if he wanted working toilets or drinking fountains. In the end, he ended up choosing toilets because I feel like that's more important. 
Um, mm-hmm. Counterfeit tickets were being sold. So the crowds were three times the size of what the park's actual capacity was. Um, vendings, de- vending machines ran out of food. People were jumping the fence at Autopia and were stealing cars before they got back into the loading dock. The teacups were completely falling apart because the mechanisms couldn't stand the heat. Mr. Toad's Wild Ride was having electrical shortages. The Mark Twain Riverboat was overloaded and was actively sinking. Dumbo was being unloaded with a step ladder. And because of all of this, the press slammed opening day, claiming that the park's opening was a failure. This day, the opening day, was referred to as Black Sunday, which we have discussed before in our trivia episode. Yes. With Sean, Alex, and Jay. Yeah. After only two months open, the one millionth visitor entered the gates. Walt urged Imagineers to stand in line and listen to the guests and learn from them. Walt knew that soon Tomorrowland would be outdated, and they remodeled it in 1959. During this remodel, Imagineers said that they needed a big, real attraction, and Walt said, okay, we're going to make a scale model of the Matterhorn and have bobsleds go around it. Yeah. And uh, because of because of Walt's like huge ideas, Imagineer Bob Gurr had to teach himself trigonometry to reimagine and reimagine physics to build the Matterhorn. Jeez. Yeah. And the legend of the basketball court inside the Matterhorn is false. The area that people call the court was originally the break room for the operators of the Matterhorn. One day someone brought in a basketball hoop and some balls just for fun on their break, but it is not a real court. Yeah. Interesting. That's the first time I've heard of it not being true. Yeah, it's not true. And it was confirmed by one of the, by the guy, the designer. Interesting. Yeah. He was like, yeah, that whole legend about it needing to be a sports facility is 100% false. 100% fake. Interesting. The Matterhorn bobsled was the first tubular steel roller coaster in the world. Walt wanted to use this technology for the monorail and had the, at the time, Vice President Richard Nixon welcome it upon its opening. This was the first monorail in North America, and the monorail was also designed by Bob Gurr. At this time, they had real guys climbing the Matterhorn and ladies in the submarine waters as the mermaids. Mark Davis was one of the first in the new wave of Imagineers in 1961. He was the creator of Maleficent, Tinkerbell, and Cruella de Vil, and he felt that visual gags were missing from Disneyland. John Hench was told to do a rendering for a restaurant in his drawing that featured birds, and Walt said, no, you can't have birds in a restaurant, they're going to poop in the food, like, you can't do that. And then Hench said, how about mechanical birds? And that's what the spark was for the inspiration for the Tiki Room. When pitching the Tiki Room to Richard Sherman, Walt made a Waythel Rogers sit behind a screen, like in The Wizard of Oz, pulling levers and pushing buttons. And the Sherman brothers were like, it's great, but what is it? And Walt said, that's what you're going to write. And the Tiki Room was the first use of audio animatronics, which is where sound and animatronics were synced up together to create a an effect that the animatronics themselves were speaking yeah i actually went to a convention um a few years ago and disney was there well disney imagineering was there and they Mm -hmm. brought one of the original tiki birds from disney world to show animatronics yeah it's a really interesting way it's a really interesting thing i love it yeah i do too because of the success of Disneyland, many companies approached WED to build showcases and pavilions for the World Fair. At the 1964 New York World's Fair, Disney had It's a Small World, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, the Carousel Theater of Progress, and Ford's Magic Skyway. There you go. And my grandmother always talks about how she went to the 1964 World's Fair and got to ride Small World before it was, like, at Disney. Cute! (laughs) Yeah. 
So Blaine Gibson was the sculptor for Mr. Abraham Lincoln for the Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln display, and Bob Gurr was the mechanical creator. They had no time to test or explain how it was going to work, so they just built it and made it work as they were going. When the Imagineers were trying to make Mr. Lincoln work a week before the World's Fair, there was a huge thunderstorm, and they couldn't do any electrical work on Lincoln, and they were like, we're screwed. Like, this is it. But... Thankfully, it worked, and it was able to go up in the World's Fair the next week. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Originally, Small World was supposed to have children's choirs who were supposed to be singing the national anthems of the countries, and it was a disaster. It was designed and built in nine months. Alice Davis, Mark Davis's wife, was hired to design the costumes, and it was capable of holding 3,000 people an hour. Which was unprecedented, like... Usually that, like, never happened. So it was a great deal because Disney got to use other people's money to develop rides. And then they had four brand new attractions for Disneyland and they didn't have to pay for them. That's awesome. Yeah. I do remember a story from the Sherman Brothers documentary on Disneyland. Mm -hmm. Because they wrote the It's a Small World song. Mm -hmm. Their first time going on it with their wives, the, like, cd or whatever broke so they couldn't listen to the like the music wasn't going on but they had all heard it so much that they like ended up singing it through the entire ride Ugh, i can hear it in my head now i know so the facade of small world needed to be a grand facade that encompassed the whole world so disney turned to mary blair Blair was the concept artist for films like Cinderella. She had very poor eyesight, but was a magician with color. Her favorites were bright, vibrant colors. And Rolly Crump worked on the shades of shapes of the facades of Small World, while Blair did the colors. By its 10th anniversary, Disneyland had um, had 50 million visitors. <laughs> yes, that's right. It said had had 50 million visitors. Yeah, by its 10th anniversary, Disneyland, Disneyland had, had had 50 million visitors. Oh, yeah. I was I was reading in my head and I, I'm sorry. It's okay. Sorry, Kara. This episode is chaos right now. <laughs> by its 10th anniversary, Disneyland had had 50 million visitors. And Pirates of the Caribbean opened in 1967. Claude Coates and Mark Davis worked together on it, and Claude did the backgrounds while Mark did the foregrounds. People said that they worked together to create beauty, but they would never be friends otherwise. And the famous Imagineer Xavier Atencio wrote the script, but people usually referred to Xavier as X. Okay. And in the 60s, theme parks and park-based entertainment boomed, and in pieces, Walt and his team secretly bought 27,000 acres of untouched land in Central Florida equal to the size of San Francisco. Walt's ideas for Epcot was that it would be a real functioning city, and from his deathbed, Walt implored to Roy that he continue the projects, and Walt Disney passed away on December 15th of 1966 at 65 years old. That evening, some of the lead Imagineers went to a bar and John Hench said, now we'll really know how much of our work, Walt, sorry, try that again. Now we'll know how much of our work Walt really did for us. Disney really wanted to create an escape from reality for adults. Yeah. And I'll let you go. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, he wanted it to be a place where both adults and children alike could enjoy themselves and they could have a good time. So in honor of Walt, the Imagineers created the haunted mansion that he'd been wanting for a long time. Yale Gracie was the designer of the spooks slash mechanics of the haunted mansion, and he relied heavily on the Pepper's ghost illusion, which if you're not aware of it, um, I'll link a video in the comments and in the description of this episode because it's really hard to explain it. But basically, there's a projection of an image onto a pane of glass. And as the projection is lit, like, so the projection isn't totally lighted, so you can't see it the whole time. 
So then as the things move around in the light, you can see what is lit and then things that aren't very well lit kind of fade away. It's really cool. They use it a lot in Disney in like a lot of ride mechanics, especially in the Haunted Mansion to get that ghosty effect. Um, the most like infamous use of it is in the ballroom scene when all of the ballroom dancers are dancing around by the table. So a fellow Imagineer, Leota Toombs, was the face of Madame Leota, and this was the first recorded use of projection mapping. Which this is going to be the first of many times she's mentioned, not just in this episode, but in our first Christmas episode she's mentioned in our notes. Mm-hmm. Um, back in Florida management, was nervous of Walt's Epcot and wanted to play it safe by building a, another larger Magic Kingdom. John Hinch took over as creative director and Roy was about to retire. He wanted everyone to be focused on one direction and on the same page. With all the building and zoning codes, Disney was running into issues with the government of Florida and approached the city officials and asked to make Disney World its own city, which would make it free from government interference. One of Walt's biggest problems was Disneyland with Disneyland was cast members walking into lands that didn't really match their costumes, and this is why they built the Utilidor system in Florida. The Mapo shop it's was Maypo. Mm -hmm. The Maypo shop was tasked with building all the audio animatronics funded by the profits from Mary Poppins. Names accordingly. Yep. The inspira inspiration for Liberty Square was Walt's patriotism. Blaine Gibson was the sculptor of all 36 heads for the Hall of Presidents. Yeah. On opening day of Disney World Florida, there were helicopters flying around drying the concrete in Fantasyland so it would be dry by the time the 10,000 guests of opening <laughs> day would arrive. Oh my gosh. So three months after Disney World opened, Roy Disney died on December 20th, 1971. Wow. So after that, Don Tatum and Card Walker took over as CEO and president of uh, respectively. The board of directors was approached by the duo and were asked what they were going to do. John Hinch took the creative reins and consulted the stockpile of ideas. At this point in time, Disneyland only had one thrill ride, which was the Matterhorn, so the Imagineers revived an old John Hinch design for an indoor roller coaster, which was something that Walt did want to create. And this is how Space Mountain was born. John Hench used to say that fear minus death equals fun. <laughs> so cute. Amongst the economic crash and its general distrust of the 70s, Card Walker took a chance on Epcot. So Marty Scalar was Walt's personal scriptwriter, and he wrote the Imagineering Bible that outlined the ideas, and uh, he basically explained what Disney thinking was when it came to Imagineering. Yes. The idea of Walt's original livable city um, society was dropped since Disney couldn't control how people lived their lives in their homes, and they decided to make it a place where the countries of the world can all come together and where today and tomorrow can meet. Epcot was something entirely different from any other park. The team could be creative and the staff bounced from project to project. The team working on Epcot was the start of the new generation of Imagineers. The older generation, such as Harper Goff and X Atencio, mm -hmm. helped these new Imagineers learn how to do things they weren't familiar with and get better at what they already knew. Yeah, Tony Baxter said, If the Magic Kingdom is fantasy made real, Epcot is reality made fantastic. And the Epcot ball took 26 months to build. Jeez. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, there is a ride inside it. So, like, yeah. that's not that hard to believe. But still. Yeah. Ub Iwerks. Iwer. That's how you pronounce his name. Oh. That's how I was going to guess. Ub Iwerks built Sir Sir Rama. Rama. Okay. Of Iwerks built Circa Rama for Disney 
because of his disappointment that Fantasia could not be shown the way he wanted. We could see them used in China, Canada, and a five-panel circle vision in France, rather than nine. Communicore was the first public introduction of touchscreen technology. Mm-hmm. And this Almost was in the, the 60s. Jeez. Yeah, this was in like the late 60s. People were like, like freaking out. <laughs> and now it's like... Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. I just showed it's all of my notifications. Literally in our pocket is touchscreen technology. <laughs> yes. Um, Communicore was the first public... Oh, wait. Almost the whole company was focused on Epcot, and Tokyo was an afterthought. So the Japanese had been bugging Disney for months for a project in Japan. So they told them, so Disney said, like, no, we don't want to work. We don't want to do this right now. Disney, the company, not the person, just to clarify. And they said, no, we don't want to do this. So tell them they have to pay for the construction of the park and all of the everything that goes with running the park, but we get to keep the profits off the top, hoping that they would say no, but they ridic- they agreed to the ridiculous demands. So OLC, or the Oriental Land Company, hired WED, and this gave the Imagineers a chance to test their designs on an international audience. The risk for Disney was a brand wi- risk, while the risk for OLC was a financial risk. OLC had to be taught how to run and maintain a Disney park. So uh, Masatomo Takahashi was the quote-unquote Disney of Tokyo. Hundreds of OLC team members were sent to Disneyland to learn the Disney way of operating. So because of this, Takahashi knew that the people wanted the Western experience of Disneyland. So... uh, But Main Street was lost on the Japanese executives, so they replaced it with an Epcot-like world pavilion. Interesting. Yeah. So OLC... That does make sense. Yeah, right? So OLC needed very clear receipts and documentation of literally everything, so this forced Disney to keep track of everything on the project, and this was like the first time they had ever done that, because all of the other projects, they're like, who cares, it's just whatever, throw that receipt away, we don't really need it, oh, it doesn't really matter, you know, oh, who needs the plans for that, we're never going to build that again, just leave it, you know? Jeez. (laughs) And 10 million people entered the park in the first year. Card Walker um, retired post-Tokyo and Epcot, and Ron Miller took over Walker's position. Walker wanted to cut all but 20 Imagineers. Miller. What did I say? Walker. Miller wanted to cut all but 20 Imagineers. When the Disney stock appeared on the market, Saul Steinberg threatened a hostile takeover by buying up 10% of the stock. He would have split the company into separate companies, and he was given $30 million for his stock and just to walk away. Um, There was a shareholder mutiny, and people demanded for new management after this. So on September 22nd of 1984, the Dream Team... Michael Uh, Eisner and Frank Wells took over as CEO and president, respectively. I miss that. Right? Everyone thought that Imagineering was going to be let go entirely since both were film guys, but Imagineer Tony Baxter pitched the idea for Star Tours to Eisner's son, Breck, who loved the idea. Eisner said, okay, let's do it. And although Star Wars was not a Disney property at the time, they understood the cultural phenomenon that Star Wars was. The tech for Star Tours came from flight simulators, and when Star Tours was finally opened, the park stayed open for 60 straight hours. The response was astronomical. People were waiting four hours in line for the ride. It gave me chills. That's me. That's my note. I know. Yeah, like, when I was watching the documentary and I, like, heard that part, I literally got chills. Like, I was like, holy well, shit. I, I forget the name of the series, but it's pretty new, and it goes into, like, history of different rides at Disney. Uh-huh. And Star Tours was one of them that they did. 
And yeah. they had George Lucas there, and he mentioned how he was there the second day that Disneyland was opened, and how he knew from the beginning like that he wanted changes to Tomorrowland. Mm-hmm. So then when Disney was like, hey, can we do a Star Wars ride? He was like, yes. That's awesome. So Michael and Frank were the breath of fresh air that the parks needed, and they wanted to shock the system and did that perfectly. Eisner felt to mark the new era that they needed to change the name from WED to Imagineering. When ticket rises rose, prices rose. They rose ticket... Let me try this again. That was weird. Okay. They rose ticket prices by 30% and sales rose too. That Which sounds is like, about what um, the new CEO is doing right now. But sales are going... I know. So I'm let's see what happens. The actual, like, yeah. So Eisner and Wells wanted to bring a new park to Florida. So the concept for MGM Studios was born. The designers were encouraged to think outside of the box to come up with new ideas and to be creative. Eisner was the one who decided that the studio tour had to be a real working studio. Unfortunately, the studio tour didn't really do so well and the studio didn't work that often so unfortunately studio tour got closed pretty pretty close behind opening right they had the backstage studio tour up until i was in middle school when they were shutting down for um star wars land for about to to come in i know okay then maybe they but- shortened it they had shortened it right like a few times Yeah, because what I remember from the studio tour when I went on it, it was, like, how they do certain effects in movies. It Mm -hmm. wasn't like you were going through an actual studio. Yeah. So they had, like, how they do, like, rumbling in a canyon, or canyon, rather. Yeah. And they went by where they work on all the costumes for the parks. Yeah. More so than it being a studio tour. Because the Disney studio closed in the early 2000s. Yeah. The Florida branch, at least, of the animation studio. There you go. That's what I meant. (laughs) So, Tony Baxter was the one who was charged with designing Splash Mountain because there was a need for a water ride in Bear Country in Disneyland. So, he had to use old animatronics from an old rundown show, which was, like... The Songs of America or like the History of America, something like that. And it was this, it was told by a bunch of farm animals singing a bunch of country songs. Um, and he needed to use an older film that they already had materials for. So naturally he chose Song of the South because it had to do with all these animals, right? Because you got the briar yeah. rabbit and the fox and all that. But... Briar rabbit, briar fox, briar bear. Yeah. So, but he didn't want to include any of the like problematic stuff so he kept it to just the animals right yeah so it took them an extra nine months to open splash mountain because they couldn't figure out how to keep the boats from just completely filling up with water which is where they came up with the design for the front of the splash mountain boats to actually be concave interesting yeah in 1990 eisner proposed a 10-year dream he called the disney decade This expansion would include hotels, shopping centers, water parks, and a new overseas park. Eisner wanted to be a part of the creative process rather than just being another behind-the-desk CEO. When the stock for Disney opened on the French Stock Exchange, um, after announcing that they would be doing a a Euro Disneyland just outside of Paris, Eisner was pelted with eggs and flour was thrown at him from the French communists and they protested the project yelling Mickey go home the project continued despite the backlash Imagineers even had their limits and they turned to local European artisans to help with the project Paul Chapman who did the window restoration for the Notre Dame Cathedral came out of retirement so he came out of retirement for this and he designed the stained glass windows, which would tell the story of Sleeping Beauty. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. The Imagineers really wanted to highlight old world artisan work. They understood yeah. that the Europeans had a fascination with like 
Old West, so they built the biggest frontier land yet. Veteran Claude Coates was a huge help when it came to designing the Euro Big Thunder Mountain because they actually had it go underwater and it's isolated. It's like its own island. Jeez. Yeah. In Discovery Land, they wanted to make sure that it would not outdate itself. They took inspiration from the story From the Earth to the Moon by the father of science fiction, Jules Verne. They had to create the first catapult launch system for roller coasters. Um, Imagineers also created the first spore that matched the ride track for an, the individual rider. And then this is a Gabby note. Yeah. Michael Eisner cannot speak French. Lol. Yeah. So let me explain. So they <laughs> played footage of Michael Eisner at the opening of Euro Disneyland. And he is like... I In the Imagineering show, right? Yeah. And he's basically saying Euro Disneyland is open for, like, enjoyment, basically. And it is the worst French I have ever heard anybody speak in my entire life. <laughs> like, I've heard fake French that sounds more like French than what Michael Eisner spoke. Like, <laughs> like seriously, you guys, look up the clip. Michael Eisner, Euro Disney opening day. Like... You will not be disappointed. I, like, could not keep it together. So, opening day of Euro Disney was met with huge crowds and excitement. Ex what was that word? <laughs> oh, no. So, opening day of Euro Disney was met with huge crowds and excitement. Eddie Soto, who was the Main Street show producer, told a story of a couple who was sat next to him, and they were, like, super posh, very fancy. He said they were pipe smokers, so you knew that they're very hoity-toity because they were pipe smokers. Um, and the classical music started blaring, and the lights went out, and the only lights that you could see were the Main Street electrical parade. And he turns to see, like, the reaction of the couple, and he cannot find them. So he turned to look two rows back, and he saw that couple waltzing in the dark. And when he told that story, I literally started tearing up. I was like, that is so sweet. Okay. And they said that, like, with Disneyland's opening and, like, going to Disney, it's giving you permission to be children again. And I really, it just, like, oh, it made me cry. I was like, this is uh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So some French critics described Disney as a cultural Chernobyl. There were signs all over France saying this mouse is dangerous. Euro Scrooge. Our towns don't belong to Disney. Disney noise and intellectual pollu pollution. So they felt that the French traditions and cultures were being ignored when Disney did not offer wine, which was usually at every meal. So they eventually were like, oh, shoot, we need to fix this. So they did. Um, but that still didn't, like, diminish the backlash that they had received for opening the park. And they were just kind of like, you know what? Whatever. People are going to think what they are going to think. Um, and Eisner said that it was a little bit foolish of them for them to charge the French what they charged in Florida. But the project cost too much and had too little attendance and two years after the opening, the park teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. They changed the name from Euro Disney to Disneyland Paris, thinking that it would evoke romance, that Paris is like, you know, Paris is beautiful, it's romantic, it's the city of love. Yeah. Um, and they had to creatively reorganize their debt, and so that way they could just keep the park doors open. So yeah. although Paris was not doing great, the reception at MGM Studios was amazing. Yes. So they had added Star Tours. There was Sunset Boulevard, which, oh, I can't remember exactly. I think Sunset Boulevard is now where Tower of Terror and Rock and Roller Coaster is, mm -hmm. that, like, street area. The Muppets, which my dad was part of the opening cast for. Um, and then projects weren't getting developed as fast enough because people kept on wanting more. Yeah, they were like, we cannot get enough ideas out there because they're getting executed so fast. It's like, as soon as they would finish a project, they had to start immediately on another one. I have to ask my dad about how it was like working as a cast member at MGM in the opening days. I'm sure that would be so fascinating to talk about. 
Yeah. So Imagineer Kevin Rafferty was the one who came up with the idea for the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. He and Marty Scalar pitched it to Eisner and Wells. Eisner loved it because... He was like in shock because he was like, oh my gosh, the elevator doesn't just move up and down. It moves forward and backwards too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and he was like, oh my gosh, Frank, we have to do this. And he was like, okay, well, like, do you love it, Michael? Like, do you really think we have to do it? Cause you know, we can do it, but it costs money. And Michael was like, yeah, I love it. Let's do it. (laughs) So that's how Tower of Terror was made. Um, And it was the first project using AutoCAD, which is a, um, Oh, animation. What's, no, not animation. It's a yeah. um I've used AutoCAD. It's an architecture drawing program. Yes, but AutoCAD also makes animation software. So oh. I've used AutoCAD Maya. That's There you go. So, yeah, they were the first one to use AutoCAD which helps to digitize the drawings. So, not all of the um architectural drawings were done by hand anymore. Um, And they asked an elevator company, actually, to create the ride mechanism. So they had to change, like, and alter the mechanisms completely that they had that didn't drop people into ones that drop people faster than free fall, which they wanted 13 stories in under a second. Yeah, that's what Disney wanted. They wanted people to drop 13 stories in under a second. So it had to be faster than free fall. Interesting. Yeah. The group that worked on Star Tours wanted to take on a new way to use the same technology, but on cars. So they said, hey, why not use Indiana Jones? And they wanted the queue to be interactive to lead you into the ride of, into the ride of the story in 1994. Right, into the story of the ride. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. And I was like, mm. you could have just changed it. Sorry. They wanted the queue to be interactive to lead you into the story of the ride. In 1994, President Frank Wells died in a helicopter crash, and it sent shockwaves through the company, and Imagineering suffered greatly. I know we've talked about it on the animation front, because mm-hmm. it was bad Yeah, for the company. Frank's death just, like, completely destroyed any momentum that they had. And 1994 began a pivotal era for Imagineers. Yeah. Um, By that time, Eisner had suffered a terrible heart attack, and he had to go through quadruple bypass surgery. And, excuse me, oof. And uh, when he recovered, he wanted to create the Disney Cruise Lines. The Imagineers were charged with designing them. The stage that they put the ship, that the, the stages that they put on those ships, the first two, the Disney Wish and the Disney... Magic. Magic, yeah. Because Fantasy and Dream were the sister ships that came after. Yeah. So on the Disney Wish and the Disney Magic, they put two theaters, each that span five decks and have 900 seats. I believe it. Yeah. At the same time, the concept for Disney's America was pitched, and they had already bought some land that was close to Washington, D.C., Um, Most of the politicians at the time were behind it, but there were a lot of historians that were opposed. It wasn't the concept, but rather the location. It was too close to a Civil War site. Um, Eisner said that had Frank been alive and had he himself been healthy, that they would have just plowed through, but he just couldn't handle it by himself and in the state he was in, so the project never continued. Amongst the Imagineers, there had been some whispers of an animal park. The Animal Kingdom was a dark horse project. This time they got experts on their side, such as Dr. Jane Goodall, um, who provided insights on how to care for the animals in the Animal Kingdom. They wanted the animals to have an unprecedented amount of space. The hardest part was getting the trees, plants, flowers, and saplings to help build the needed plant life for the animals. The Tree of Life, which is the park's central icon, is 14 stories tall, and it, um, however, it had to be able to withstand hurricane force winds, so they used a framework of an offshore oil rig to build the tree. John yeah. Road. Go ahead. 
John Road was one of the Joe project Road. lead. Joe Road was one of the project leads for Animal Kingdom. The creative team traveled all over to find artisans and craftsmen to help build the Animal Kingdom. They wanted it to feel like it was succumbing the, to the forces of nature. The Kilimanjaro Safari took great care in how to safely mix species. They tricked the animals into staying in photogenic spots by strategic placement of trees, feeding stations, and even air conditioners. An animal kingdom opened on April 22nd of 1998, which was Earth Day, and the park opened before dawn. Yeah. Jeez! Why'd you say it like that? Before dawn? (laughs) Yeah. I've been up before dawn, like, two days this week. I know, but, like... Can you imagine park um, dropping, like rope dropping for that park when it opened at dawn? No, thanks. That's why I said geez like that. <laughs> no, thanks. I mean, yeah, but yeah, it's not that bad. <laughs> Plus, then you get like all day, literally. Yeah, but Animal Kingdom closes early. Yeah, then you can go to another park. Yeah, that's what I normally do. Yeah. So the Oriental Land Company reached back out to Disney in 1993, and they wanted a second park. Imagineers proposed some of the other parks that they had in Florida, like Epcot or MGM Studios or a Magic Kingdom, but, or sorry, but a Animal Kingdom. But the Japanese were like, no, we want a sister Magic Kingdom from scratch. So Imagineers were like, okay, we already have Disneyland. What about Disney Sea? They took it a little literally. (laughs) So the Imagineers felt they got to stretch their creative muscles for the first time in a little while on Tokyo Disney Sea. Disney Sea is actually on the sea because it's the only Disney park to overlook an actual like outside landmark or outside world. Interesting. Yeah. In 1994, Eisner took over a new, started a new precedent in Disneyland. Paul Presser, Paul Pressler took over and he was a merchandising guy so he did not understand like the tribal familial vibes that Disneyland has um and he brought in merchandising people and that kind of thing like the people who don't know like the culture that is Disney so at the time Anaheim was totally run down, totally like the city was bankrupt. It was like not a nice place to vacation. So they felt that they really needed to develop the city itself, but they also needed a second park. So Tony Baxter pitched a park called Westcott, which would take you to the seven continents and each continent would have a different hotel, which they loved the idea of, but it was too expensive. So they said no. Eisner liked the idea of celebrating California, so the idea for California Adventures was born. They wanted to evoke, um, like, the feelings of old Hollywood and classic California scenery and beach culture. The budgets for Tokyo Disney Sea and California Adventure were extremely different, like, two totally different extremes. Tokyo, literally, they could have as much money as they wanted because they were spending the money from the OLC, whereas California Adventures had one of the tightest park budgets to date because it was all on Disney's dime. And they had to also renovate the city of Anaheim itself. Jeez. Yeah. So, engineer Mark Sumner built the ride system for sewing, soaring over California because they thought it would be a cheap way to get a good ride, right? Yes. So, because you could fit a lot of people in those little mechanics things, and it's like you're in a screen, you're like going into the screen. Yeah. So... Really quick, I just wanted to mention, watching the old footage for Soarin' Over California literally made me cry. I was like, I'm so (laughs) sad. I was like, I miss this so much. Yes. So in February... February. Go ahead. Do you want me to do it? Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. So in February of 2001, California Adventures opened, and it was a very cold reception. Can we just... Because I had to look up when I saw... February 2001, because that was the year I was born and month. Mm-hmm. Disney's California Adventure is 12 days older than me. 
it opened on February 8th. There you go. I, d- I just want that to be known. <laughs> I love that for you. So California Adventures could not compete with Disneyland right there because of the lack of IP and the smaller size of the park. Um, Disney's California Adventures... Um, many of the executives say that Disney's California Adventures was a business decision rather than a creative decision. And in the long term, it was actually bad for business to fix the creative aspects of the park. Interesting. Because they're still fixing it to this day. They literally just put in Pixar Pier like two years ago. Yeah. A year ago. No. Yeah. Two or three years ago. Like. Yeah. The company was obligated to put a second gate at Paris, and it was the smallest and least attended park of them all. Paris' second gate made California look great. In 1997, yeah, in 1997, the UK released Hong Kong from its rule. Disney jumped on the opportunity to build in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government reclaimed 500 acres of land for Disney to build their new park. And they originally wanted the park to be as cheap um, as possible to gain as much revenue as possible. The original designs were flat and with no water. A feng shui master was hired to help consult on the project. I've never seen feng shui like written out. out. Yeah. So I was like, what is that for? <laughs> it's feng shui. <laughs> yeah. But I, I ended up saying it. Yeah, you did it's good. It's just I've never ended up, I've never seen it, like, spelled out. I've only heard it. Um, he emphasized the importance of wood, stone, plants, and water. They wanted to pay every respect to the Chinese culture and make sure every precaution was met. Opening day was extremely hot, and this time the heels weren't sinking into the asphalt, but the benches that night they had to be pulled out the uh, they had to pull the benches out and reinstall them unfortunately the crowds felt the park was too focused on the children they also felt that it was too small and it was the third time that building a small park had failed yeah it was a funny the com- the comments from the engineers about opening day or the imagineers from opening day at um hong kong were saying hey it's 50 years later and we're still having problems with our asphalt yeah now, Gabby, would you like to take a short break before we finish the rest of this? Yeah, for sure. Because now okay. we're going to get into the 2000s and we're going to get into the 50th anniversary of Imagineering. Yes. We'll be back. And we're back. So, Kara, er, <laughs> so Emma, what did you do for your break? I got some more of these dark chocolate mint creams and just like, you know, Scored on Amazon. My friend's getting married um, next year, and I'm one of her bridesmaids. I'm actually her maid of honor, and I was looking at dresses. She's letting us choose our own. I love that. I know. It's so much better when them, than when they're like, oh, everybody has to wear the exact same dress because the exact same dress doesn't look good on everybody. Yeah. She was like, oh. sage green and long. Yeah. Go forth. So, that's What about fair. you, Gabs? I went pee, and I got myself some chocolate as well, because they left me a giant, literally a Hershey bar the size of my head on the counter. I'm here for one night. <laughs> hey. I'm like, okay. I'm an idiot. Yeah. So, you want to get back into it? Okay. In 2002... They celebrated the 50th anniversary of Imagineering, and shortly thereafter, Roy E. Disney resigned. He also fought to remove Eisner from his position, and Roy felt that Pixar was doing more for Disney than Disney was. Yeah. Which actually, Bob Iger also thought that. Um, mm-hmm. I mentioned it later in our notes for this, but he went to the Hong Kong opening, and he was watching the parade, and was like, wow. All the new characters are Pixar characters. Mm-hmm. We should change that. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about that in our Pixar episode as well. Yeah. 
So on October 1st in 2005, Bob Iger took over as CEO of the Walt Disney Company. The former ABC president rose quickly within the ranks with a vision to change that depended on three three key strategies, which were international expansion, new technology, and fresh creative content. But Bob Bob inherited a Disney animation studio in disarray. There was a string of recent flops, such as The Emperor's New Groove, Treasure Planet, and Home on the Range, that threatened its long-term well-being, and Mothers with Children Under 12 rated Pixar's brand higher on average. After realizing that all of the characters in the new parades were either from the new Pixar movies, whose terms of use were about to stop, or the old characters like Snow White, Bob Iger won over Steve Jobs and negotiated a swift buyout of Pixar for, bum, drumroll please, we've already talked about this, $7.4 billion in stock, billion with a B. Yes. After realizing that California Adventures wasn't as welcoming as Disneyland right next to it, the Imagineers went into a five-year renovation effort. Um, While the park stayed open, Imagineers set out to demolish and rebuild entire areas, including the classic California postcard entrance. Sad. (laughs) That's like the saddest part. The letters letters are at like some mall in like Glendale, I think. That's cool. Yeah, there's like a mall where you can find the California letters. Let me see if I can find it. Okay. Okay. And early on in the design process for Carsland, Imagineers realized that they could use 3D and VR technology to help in the design process. They used a room called the DISH, which stands for either Digital Immersive Showroom or the Disney Holodeck, depending on who you were talking to. Waiting for Gabby to see if... The letters were removed in January of 2011... Okay. But where did they go? Here. They were donated to the city of Anaheim for use. Uh, The California letters were donated to the Friends of the California State Fair, a nonprofit organization, and currently sit at the entrance to the Cal Expo Fairgrounds. Interesting. Yep. And then this is where we kind of get into some updates to some of the old rides and to new things such as Haunted Mansion Holiday, Mm -hmm. where Kim Irvine reprised her mother's role of Madame Leota for the seasonal overlay. Um, This time, the projected head of Madame Leota conjured up the 13 days of Christmas. And fans were okay with this update because it's only a temporary change for the holiday time. Some of these other ones had terrible, like, Mm -hmm. um, reception from... Disney fans until it was actually done. Like the next one, which is the Small World update, which is that 29 dolls based on Disney animated characters were going to be added to the Small World, and it started a Small World War. (laughs) That's That's cute. That's how it was phrased in the documentary. Among Disney fanatics. And this is only in Disneyland. Yeah. It's not in Disney World. Mm -hmm. Disney's... Disney faithful. Oh, thank you. Disney faithfuls believed that inserting fictional Disney characters in real-world communities detracted from Walt's original intent. So what the Imagineers did is they carefully worked each one into the country where their story is actually from, which I think is a great way to do it. Yeah. So they have, like, Alice in England. And Leo and and Stitch in Hawaii. Yeah. Well, Hawaii is the United States, but still. But still, yeah. And then... The Pirates of the Caribbean, um, Imagineers added the popular movie character Jack Sparrow, and then they later updated the story to keep with the changing cultural times by adding the red-headed female pirate and replaced to the, like, fire wife scene. hmm <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase it. Yeah. <laughs> to meet the future, Bob Iger went on a spending spree by buying some of the most revered pop culture properties. These were Marvel Entertainment, um licensing the theme park rights to Avatar from Lightstrom Entertainment, and they bought Lucasfilms, which is the home of Star Wars. Yes. And then the last little bit of Imagineering um, new technologies that was under Bob Iger was the free-ranging ride system, 
and it is a trackless system and it's run by a series of RFID chips embedded in the ground and then it's ultimately controlled by a wireless system off board through a series of computers that tells the vehicles which direction and which path to take. Yeah. And you can see this in Rise of the Resistance and in the new Ratatouille ride. Yeah. So this definitely isn't like an end of Imagineering. Like Imagineering is constantly going to be around and they're constantly going to be coming up with the newest technologies to build the next great thing. Yes. Like the Spider-Man animatronic for uh, Avengers Campus. That's a great example. Like seeing it in action, you think it's a real person. It legit looks like a real person. Yeah. It's really cool. And... You know, we've seen the implementation of the Marvel and um, Lucasfilms licensing and the Avatar as well, because we've been there in the past few years quite frequently. And, um, you know, Marvel's Avengers Campus opened in California Adventures in 2021, as well as Batu opening in 2019. Yeah. And... Avatar is just amazing. I still don't know how they did some of it. Like the floating mountains. Imagineering. Of Avatar. Magic. Yeah. I, it's magic. Because yeah. that's what it they is. do. They make magic a reality. Yes. Yep. So. Yeah. Like we said, this is definitely not the end of the Imagineering story. And there's definitely going to be more to come. So. Yes. Who knows? Maybe if we're still doing this podcast in 10 years, we could be like, hey, look at all these great things. Yeah, that'd be crazy to like look back on this episode in like 10 years and see how far Imagineering's come in that time. Yeah. That'd be nuts. Yeah. Because like the free ranging ride system's being used in so many new stuff. Mm -hmm. Runway Railway too. Run. I knew I was forgetting one. (laughs) Yep. But, hey, Imagineers had a tough time with the free-ranging ride system. Yep, especially here. Well, in Disneyland, yeah. Yeah. For Rise of the Resistance. Yep. We've told that story a few times. But for those of you who don't know the story, basically the chips got embedded too far into the concrete, so the onboard uh, readers couldn't pick up the signals from the chips. (laughs) So they had to tear up the whole floor and start over. That would suck. Yep. Could you imagine being like, crap, now we have to tear up this whole entire floor. And we can't no. touch these chips because we can't remake them. These are the only ones we got. No. No, right? Anyway, so that's really it for this bit of the Imagineering story until we get more in the future. Maybe in a few years we'll revisit yes. But Emma, shall we see our uh, faithful listeners in the outro? Yes, we shall. So please exit the ride vehicle to the left and keep walking. The pathway will lead you back into the Magic Kingdom. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Fan Fatales. Gabby, would you like to tell our lovely audience what we will be chatting about next week? Next week, we're going to be chatting about all things Nightmare Before Christmas. Super stoked. Woo! I'm very excited. Yeah, because people were pretty mad we didn't talk about it. Yeah. For Christmas, or for Halloween. For Halloween, yeah. So we decided November, so it's in between Halloween and Christmas. Yeah. It doesn't come out the week of Thanksgiving, though. No. We have a special episode (laughs) for that, so y'all just got to stay tuned for that. And remember to subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. We are on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And subscribe to us on YouTube. Please leave us a review and comment down below to tell us what you thought of the show. Remember to follow us on Instagram at FanFatalesPod for the latest updates and to possibly be featured in a future episode. Now, Emma, where can the people find you on social media? So my Instagram and TikTok are both at SnippyEmma. What about you, Gams? I'm at Gabby Gent on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. That's G-A-B-Y-J-E-N-T. Our music is by our amazing friend, Maddie Macon. And our editing is by the wonderful Kara Linsmeyer. As always, thank you for tuning in. Bye. Bye! The views expressed in this episode do not reflect the brand or the company they're about.